Welcome to episode 66 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via our YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, how are things with you? Uh, Good, thanks Dan. Uh, It's life is returning to normal slowly, the sort of Damocles that has been over us even whilst we could go about our daily lives is, is slowly lifting. So, uh, yes, um, you know, I want to say it quietly, but it feels like things are getting back to a normal. Uh, let's certainly hope so. We've got uh, we've got Ukraine and uh, Russia probably going to war and uh, there's an apocalypse, it wins outside. But, yeah, so everything's absolutely back to normal, isn't it? Uh, well, I'm delighted that the two for us to be joined today on the podcast by the leader of the Alliance for Democracy and Freedom Party, Dr. Tech Kong. Tech, welcome to the podcast. Good evening, Dan. Good evening, Michael. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, Mike, what are we going to be talking about today? So we're going to be talking about COVID and are there all the restrictions going? Uh, we're going to be talking about the cost of living crisis. And we're going to be chatting with Dr. Kong about his party and... Uh, his experience in recent times. Splendid. Well, yes, the, uh, the we've had our Freedom Day, as it were, Freedom Day 2.0 a few weeks ago. It seems to be getting, as you say, things seem to be getting back to normal. Certainly, um, I, I was uh, out in London last night and it was uh, it was very busy. There was uh, very little in the way of social distancing in the bars, I can, I can tell you. But yes, the Coronavirus Act, it uh, expires at the end of March. We are told that uh, it looks as the uh, the way the data is going that uh, that Boris is going to free us a month early though he's going to come back from uh, from half term as it were uh, at the end of February and uh, they're going to set out to us the plan to live with COVID. Interesting. Are we going to be getting our freedoms back or uh, or what? What's your thoughts on this, Mike? Um, I think you know, I, I, having sounded pretty upbeat, yes, you're right. Um, it's upbeat compared to where we are rather than where we should be. Uh, clearly, there does appear to be the natural desire of government to always own more, control more, take more uh, it is there. And we see it in, in some of the, the acts around uh, online speech and, and, and what have you. Um, that's very much over, over there. It's very hard to believe that all of these civil servants empowered to control us and act against us uh, uh, during the past two years, will completely give that up. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, not all of the United Kingdom is free as other parts. And, and indeed, you know, uh, if you like, our, our our brothers across the uh, the ocean are not as free as, as we are. But it's got to be good that the Coronavirus Act is coming to an end. It's got to be good that things are coming back to a, a more normal scenario. So, yes, let's worry about the problems. But, uh, you know, it's been a tough two years. Let's uh, enjoy the uh, uh, enjoy the, the returned and should never have been taken away freedom uh, a, a bit first. So, Tech, are you uh, optimistic about uh, Boris's announcement? I have to be excused for being sceptical. Uh, we have known in the recent past that uh, there has been capitulations. Um, my cynical view is that the... Uh, the final lifting of various restrictions would roughly coincide with campaigning for the local government elections. So we have yet to see uh, a permanent uh, retraction of all the constraints on us. Now, you might call it Freedom Day, but some of my colleagues are suffering under the censorious uh, approach that the government has adopted. And we are still as we speak today, this afternoon, for example, a nurse was in tears because she was disciplined on rather spurious grounds for what was considered officially as being harmful 
to her patients. A nurse who had um, exhibited sterling qualities in her in her discharge of professional duties, years of experience and years of dedication has suddenly come to a precipitate halt because the authorities decide that her views are not in line with the government narrative. And that is the censorious. And that is the uh, situation we have uh, at the moment. So, yes, we, we'll have to see whether we are, you know, fully released, as it were, and uh, what powers the government is going to try to keep for itself, you know, just in case. Uh, but certainly in Scotland, they, uh, the SNP have made it very clear that uh, they want to keep these powers just in case uh, forever. Mm. Uh, Mike, are you surprised by anything that uh, that the SNP come out with these days? Uh, no, um, it's, there, there is nothing endearing about the SNP, is there? Um, wanting to be an independent Scotland, as indeed... You know, we want, wanted to be an independent Britain. It's an entirely reasonable uh, thing. Uh, it's entirely reasonable to, uh, you know, you can come from a good place to argue against unionism in these islands. Um, but the SNP has way beyond that. They actively seek ways of uh, firstly uh, disrupting the union, disrupting the good governance in Scotland, and now, of course, of, of keeping control over the, their people. I think increasingly it seems clear to me there is a a cabal at the heart of the SNP that only want to leave Britain because they think they can run things in Scotland not because they think a independent Scotland is something uh desiring or of itself um they just want to be different um and I I feel very sorry for the people of Scotland if they ever ever get the chance of the opportunity of seeing them with a full set of powers well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily COVID related, but, you know, there was the, was it the MSP or an SMP councillor who said that, uh, that anybody who laughed at, uh, at the, uh, the, the recent Jimmy Carr joke um, should be locked up. And the thing about that is not one, one councillor says a bad thing. You know, this happens. There are a lot of councillors. It's that nobody swiftly said, don't be so silly. Or, or even stronger words. Um, it, it's that actually that kind of thought has become normalised and, and it is normalised and increasingly they're looking to bring it into the law in Scotland um, in terms of what you can say and do. So, yeah, no, a, a terrifying uh, uh, party, I think, in, in many, many ways. And that's got nothing to do with their desire for independence. It's got everything to do with the way they govern once they are in control. So tech, obviously, you know, we might think we've been under terrible restrictions and we might be have grave concerns about the way that the government is, is trying to tell us how to think, et cetera, here, here in England. It seems to be much worse in Scotland. What's your, uh, what's your take on things north of the border? Um, well, I happen to have a Scottish wife, so uh, I can speak with some uh, understanding what's happening. It's a real shame because I think as as our as a country, the United Kingdom has always prided itself in uh, freedom of speech, and I think we have, um, under successive governments, suffered attrition of that privilege. Um, I think the direction that Scotland is taking, not its people, but the uh, the so-called leaders, uh, is is leading into a very grim um, future. That's my concern, really. Indeed, concerning times north of the border. Mm. Well, don't worry, though, because we've got some more good news. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the cost of living is rocketing. General inflation is, you know, getting on for getting on for double figures. Um, and the government's got its little net zero targets, which uh, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll move on to. But we've got household fuel bills going up £700, roughly due to the changes in the price cap. But don't worry, though, because you're going to get £200 back or something, but then you've got to pay it back £40 a year for the next five years, apparently. And uh, and they're going to really help us out with their uh, account, well, some people out with a, a council tax discount of £150 per year, uh, at least for this, this coming year. 
Forgive us, Tech, for being a little bit Croydon centric here, but you know, mm -hmm. 150 pounds might be a drop in the ocean compared to what we're going to have to pay in council tax after our uh, our council went uh, well went bust. Yes, mm. Mike, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, this 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 tax on your uh, tax on your savings. We know why inflation's coming along. It's because it's the same reason inflation always comes along. It's because we've been printing money, we've been de debasing the currency. Um, there is an oversupply of money, uh, and that that feeds through to prices. That's how inflation works. How anyone thinks, and that's what's going to hurt us. That's going to hurt a lot of people. It's why they're seeing big price rises. Uh, wages may no doubt go up, uh, and in fact they already are. But people are not going to get to enjoy the benefits of those increases because certain core commodities are costing more. The way you get around that is absolutely not to spend even more government money, be it in loans or, or rebates or whatever it is, uh, which only generates a further need to print more cash and inflate the currency even more. It, you know, it's painful, it's unpalatable, but the only way to get out of an inflation spiral is to uh, what used to be known as control, was it M4, the uh, um, supply of money. Uh, can, you know, some fiscal responsibility, some reduction of, of spending, um, uh, you know, and dare I say it, even some reduction of taxes to grow the economy uh, in real terms uh, and, and give us a chance of actually growing our way out of trouble, giving us a chance of getting ahead of these costs. Mm. I, I just don't see any, any, any hope that the government doing that or even understanding that, that they are the root cause of the problem they're now trying to solve. Indeed. I mean, there are ways we could re reduce our costs and have a bit of um, energy security, which is uh, you know, something we could probably have, at, you know, be good to have at the moment, given uh, what might be going on with, with Russia. Um, but the government seems to be very much against using our natural resources, shale gas, and uh, they seem to be still, you know, why can't we just have more, more nuclear? It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's better in terms of uh, carbon emissions if you if you believe in that sort of thing uh, tech yes it's not looking good is it i don't think so i think uh, the politicians have got it badly wrong for whatever reason um energy security as you mentioned should be a priority as is food security and i can't understand really why one nation like ours is going to make a great deal of difference by self-flagellating its population I would like to see um, taxes being lowered, not raised, so that we can stimulate the economy. We need to look at alternative sources of energy. We have uh, new ways of, of um, retrieving the gas. It doesn't have to be by the, um, the method, you know, which the protesters claim to have set up seismic uh, consequences and so on. Uh, we, we, can, we should try, for example, offshore um, mining for gas. There's so many other ways of doing it. We should pursue, for example, a, a hydrogen policy, um, as you say, quite rightly, pursue the nuclear policy. Uh, There's so many different ways of doing it, but we, we seem hell-bent on becoming the, uh, the Saudi of wind power, for example, and uh, desecrate the landscape with lots and lots of windmills, which have their own downsides. And, and as for... Um, for a clear future going forward, I think we, we need to be, we need to have a national debate on how we want to see the country going forward. Well, I mean, there have been some calls in, in some parts for uh, a referendum on the, all this uh, net zero stuff, but we'll, uh, we'll see if that gains any, any sort of oh, momentum. That's right. Uh, I think the net zero thing is, is extremely punitive on, on the, the people that uh, rely on you know, things staying fairly stable for some time. There are a lot of people who will be severely penalised by, for example, the, the switch in boilers, the switch to electric cars and so on. And there'll be a diminution of freedom because we have, we will have these draconian measures uh, punishing our people. It isn't right at all. Thanks, I think absolutely right, which is, it is punitive measures punishing our people. It, I, it's the first time I recall a government ever deciding we want to have a lower standard of living. And, and I, as I think about it, I can only think of the Puritans in the civil 
over the period after the Civil War, maybe maybe choosing a similar vein for for the British people. You know, we might not agree with particular past Conservative Labour governments and and their policies, but they at least had the intention, if not the, f- the effects, they at least had the intention of growing the economy, providing a better standard of living, and, and to put not too fine a point on it, everyone's expectation was that granny would be warm in winter. Now we've got a government supported by all party, all of the Westminster parties, that is actively deciding it wants next winter people to be cold because uh, and they want us to pay more for fuel. Uh, they want us to not have the energy independence we want as a citizen nation. Uh, or, and we could easily reclaim through fracking. They, they have actively chose to, choosing a path of making us worse off. That's just balmy. That, uh, that is a reason for a referendum, to my mind, is that uh, I don't imagine we'll ever get one, because how on earth do you make a case for that? Well, indeed. But, I mean, we, we talked recently on the podcast, as, uh, as many have, about uh, party gate and uh, whether Boris would survive the, the coming weeks, and he's uh, still, still clinging on in there at the moment. Um, and indeed, the Tories seem to have gone, seem to have got clawed back some of the, the losses in the polls. But, you know, party gate is one thing. I do wonder if, and if this sort of thing comes in over the next couple of years, whether, you know, people will forget about party gate because, you know, this will be doing far more damage to the, to the Tories ahead of the next general election if the inflation's you know, very high and if, uh, as you say, if, if people can't even afford to, to heat their homes. What do you think will be the, the political damage, Tech? I'll start by saying the Labour Party doesn't represent the working classes anymore. And the Conservative government, the Conservative Party, are no longer the custodians of, of conservatism. I think with that deviation from their central ethos, we need to have a new way of doing politics. And I think we certainly are at the right time in the political life of our country going forward to present to the people a new way uh, of addressing our needs. I think what we have at the moment is a Conservative government that is very similar to Labour in terms of raising taxes, um, doing its own thing without caring for the people. Uh, There are lots and lots of examples. I mean, we, we can discuss this at length. But in short, I think we have to present a credible alternative. And there are lots and lots of cogent reasoning for saying why the landscape, the political landscape needs to change. The duopoly is totally anachronistic. It needs to change. Well, Mike, I think you've got uh, you've got some questions for uh, Dr. Kong. I do, and uh, so uh, great great point to pick up on there. Um, uh, I think is to no doubt uh, you might have a chance to expand on. Which is so. Firstly, obviously, um, we mentioned you're the leader of the Alliance for Democracy and Freedom. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, about the party? It's very, uh, yeah. I don't want to be too indulgent in terms of my personal history, but uh, I've been a GP since 1982, working from one of the 10% poorest wards in the country. Um, And that gave me a lot of insight into how uh, the poorer people cope with life. Um, So as I progressed towards um, the 90s, I was finding that delivering health care as a patient advocate was becoming more and more difficult. When Tony Blair came into power, I thought the situation would improve, but to the contrary, uh, a lot of people were finding great hardship in accessing health care. In those days, I had no um, interest in politics, uh, let alone any knowledge about how it works and so on. So I became very disgruntled, and it so happened that one of my patients was the leader of a conservative group in Leicestershire County Council. And uh, the late Anna Pullen, as the lady's name was, um, she persuaded me to take an interest in politics because she said, look, the only way to change things is not from your desk behind, you know, not from behind your desk and talking to patients, although you can make a difference to people's lives, but if you wish to do this on a national basis, you really have to participate in politics. And I pondered for a while and I said, look, OK, I'll take up your offer. So I was introduced to uh, Oliver Heal, who was then the 
uh, Select Committee on Health Chairman. He read my uh, brief and he thought it was quite a quite a commendable piece, if I may say so. And I did a similar copy to Tony Blair uh, very naively, obviously receiving no notice at all. Um, I was invited to sit the Parliamentary Assessment Board exam of the Conservative Party and obviously I got anointed as a candidate and uh, and I began my journey through politics and learning uh, bit by bit as I went along. My sole dedication was really as a GP. So I um, became more aware of the, uh, the, the difficulties people face when there's a disconnect between um, politicians, policies, and the people's needs. Um, it, it's basically, uh, you know, we uh, as a nation have some brilliant ideas. I think the National Health Service was was a, was an absolutely brilliant concept, and but we've deviated too far from it. We have increased its remit. We have increased spending. We have increased management, and the fault now is we find you know standards have become lower despite higher investment. We have the doctors being manipulated by financial incentives rather than professionalism. And these are very serious indictment. And it, I feel ashamed as a, as a practitioner to actually point out the difficulties we face. So came 19, sorry, came the, um, uh, the period just before referendum, the Conservative Party assembled its candidates had a review of the position as far as the referendum was concerned. So I went for my interview and uh, I, was, I was checked for my preferences. I was strictly a Brexiter and I explained why to them. And I also was very critical of the health policy despite having set up a policy forum on health back in 2003 for them. Um, so I received my marching notice before the referendum. I found it very difficult as a deputy chairman of a constituency uh, branch to continue in the party. I asked for reinstatement as a candidate, but to no avail. And I realized at that stage, my days in uh, the Conservative Party were numbered, so I left. Um, I was invited to join UKIP because of my Brexit stance uh, by Roger Helmer, who left the Conservative Party prior to my departure. And I stood against the incumbent in my constituency. I think that was a bad move, really. I lost my deposit, even though as um, the campaigner for my MP, I actually, with my team, produced a 10,000 extra majority. So my journey was dotted with um, successes and disappointments, really. And I said to myself, I'll quit politics until um, some ex UK members, including people like uh, Mike Hookham, um, they were interested in what I had to say and do for our country's health policy. So I was invited to join them. And that's where I am today. Um, I think their approach to politics is extremely laudable because they're trying to change politics without uh, the strictures of the past, although to register with the Electoral Commission, you have to have a name, you have to declare yourself as a political party. But the three words in the name tells you something about the intention. So we wish to remain flexible in terms of accommodating a breadth of uh, political views, but as long as there's a, a degree of consistency, uh, we will support anyone and, any, and every minor party, as long as it's a patriot, patriotic party, uh, not involved in things which are grossly illegal. And uh, we, we like to think, you know, we stand for democracy and freedom. We, we, we have a system of democracy where everything is anything but democratic. Uh, we have freedom that is progressively constrained. Um, and these are the things which are, I think, very dear to the, uh, the British people. So that's how the alliance and democracy would go forward from here to appeal to people who wish 
to uh, to seek a restitution of um, the housing days of British politics. No, excellent. Thank you. That's a fascinating bit of background there. So you, you mentioned work for the NHS. Um, obviously, we've just been through the two years of uh, the pandemic and lockdown, and and hopefully we're coming to a, a, an end for that. Um, you've worked in the NHS for that time. What's your impression um, of, of what we did right and, and what we got wrong during that time? I think we did, well, I don't think I would use the word we. I think the government did mostly the wrong things. Uh, for a start, I mean, as, as somebody who's been very involved in clinical research, I was a research registrar in Glasgow for a, a, a few years. And I can tell you in clinical trials, when we do clinical trials, we have uh, something called informed consent. So a, pe a person wishing to participate in a clinical trial would be given uh, the information about the product under investigation. Uh, so there'll be a list of things, for example, I will say to the patient, look, this is a new antibiotic, we're testing against uh, an established antibiotic. Uh, you could be given the placebo or the real thing but we monitor your vital signs, your hematology, biochemistry, drug levels, and whatever is necessary. And should anything untoward happen, we pull you out of the trial, we do a code break to see what you're taking, and if, if, um, if it's placebo, obviously it, it wouldn't matter too much, we'll just get on treating you. Um, but whatever it is, we, we will treat you and try and get you right. And we, well, we not try, we must get you right. But you have the you have the freedom to decline to participate, and you can withdraw at any time. Now, with the COVID vaccines, what happened was it was in a clinical trial situation. It was brought up to a level of uh, readiness for distribution uh, by the Americans under the Operation Warp Speed. But what was remarkable was. Uh, within months of the thing being uh, trialed uh, and thought to be safe, emergency use authorization, EUA, was brought in, and then it was um, offered to populations across the world. Um, but the anomaly I find is this. You have something that hasn't finished clinical trials. We have no long-term data. The, the clinical trials were not expected to finish until 2023, but we had uh, a situation where we would uh, insist, we would heavily drive the uh, mass vaccination program. And the, the, the very curious anomaly is that you don't have enough information to give your consent. You take the medication, you take the product, and then you're not monitored at all. So if anything happened, you report back to your GP or whoever it is, and they'll say, it's probably nothing to worry about, or we'll give you some uh, antihistamine, it could be a minor allergy. So there was this uh, tremendous blind spot in, in, in a lot of clinicians, and those who dare question it were actually um, viewed very badly under the censorious attitude and some some clinicians were actually suspended for going against the, um, the official narrative. So those are inconsistencies, inconsistency, inconsistency in relation to freedom to participate, inconsistency in relation to monitoring. So there was no pharmacovigilance as, as such. And there is, there is a dearth of alternative method. Now, when you enter somebody in a clinical trial, you always say, look, you're free to leave. And if you need any treatment, we'll give you alternative treatment. There was hardly any effort or money spent in looking at alternatives, viable alternatives. So we had a lot of things wrong. And I was very open-minded to start with until as a clinician, I noticed people coming in with uh, temporally linked events that were quite serious. And I can tell you things like, for example, uh, thrombotic episodes backed up by uh, biochemical tests, the D-dimer test, for example, um, prove unequivocally that these people were having problems from the vaccine. I'm not saying the vaccines are totally unsafe, but neither am I saying that they are safe. 
No, and that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that to me leads us to a, a point of, uh, it comes to choice, doesn't it? Uh, it yes. As you say, you can inform consent. And not only that, added to the problem, we have very coercive measures. So the, if you remember, the care workers were summarily discharged for not accepting the vaccine. That cannot be acceptable in any free society. The signs, as Dr. Steve James said on television when he uh, confronted Mr. Sajid Javid, the signs is weak, as he uh, to quote um, Dr. James. There is no reason why you would sack somebody without even checking the immune status, would you? No, indeed. Uh, well, and 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 actually, you know. Why are you sacking people in an industry that we know we need more staff, um, where there is no uh, clear indicator that these these unvaccinated people were causing a problem? Mr. Mr. Javid himself had two jabs and still got COVID. Yes, and there are some some distortion of scientific facts. If a vaccine, the so-called vaccine, cannot prevent either infection or transmission then I would question the validity of coercive measures for staff working on the front line, just because they're working on the front line. Should you dismiss them because of their personal view? Do you rob them of the freedom of choice and say, look, you're fired because you're not complying with a vaccine, so-called vaccine, that may or may not work for you and may or may not prevent transmission? No, indeed, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very strong point, and and I think we've said all along, uh, you know, take the vac. Well, I've said, take the vaccine, don't take the vaccine. It's your choice, but it's got to be your choice. Mm. So that maybe leads us onto something there, which you, you talked about. Uh, that's where we are today. Um, obviously, the AFD you've mentioned is a, is 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 an alliance, and, and you're open to to things. But but if someone was looking at the party, what would you say your top priorities were? Uh, the party in power? I think the priority is to um, return the power to the people. So the first belief is that democracy should be local. Um, there is no way a central part, a, a, a central um, committee would be able to dictate, so we don't have a whip, dictate to what um, the locals in a given area require. So one of the features would be uh, localism with local democracy. So if you live in Croydon and our headquarters is in, at the moment, uh, Oldham, there is no way we can dictate to you that you should vote in any particular way if you should be elected by the people of Croydon to represent Croydon. I think that's a very strong point that we are localizing democracy to the people of the area. The second is we are happy to support any individual as, a, as a, an independent candidate or new party with shared interests, shared interests in promoting freedom, in promoting democracy, in uh, growing small businesses, in, in uh, securing our energy security, in achieving uh, food security, farming. We we're very, very proud of farmers. Uh, we are very committed to helping our veterans, helping homelessness. We want to build the economy from ground up. And just coming back to something you mentioned earlier at the NHS, and obviously you, you've looked at some of your, your plans for it. Is there anything you've particularly got there that you would, you would change in the, the way the NHS is structured or, or, or how that service would operate today? Yes, there is something called a tripartite compact which underpins the NHS. Uh, put simply, it's a compact, it's a, it's a, if I put it in simple language, a three-party uh, way of delivering health. The government is one part of the party, a uh, compact. The government takes money from the people in terms of taxation, uses the money to pay the doctors, who then looks after the patients, the people. So the tripartite compact is government, people, doctors government, people, doctors, like that. 
Now, what's happened over the, over over a period of time, regardless of the way it's uh, structured, whether it's you know in the in the days when I first entered general practice, family practitioner committees, or at the moment as it is, um, clinical commissioning groups, you know, CCG, uh, and then hospital trusts and so on, it doesn't really matter very much. What we have is a very severe distortion of the way health is delivered. The government at the at the top of the compact is using money to achieve targets. So whereas when I first entered as a general practice, the predominant amount of money that I get came from capitation. It now comes from hitting targets, compliance. So what we find is a profession driven, well, not, not just a profession, I think individuals with a need to achieve a livelihood income following targets because it pays, okay? Where the, the nature of the job is actually to get your patients better, do a good job, but without listening to the managers. You don't want, you don't want managers to step in to tell you what to do and how to prescribe and so on. To be incentivized, to be given money to say you prescribe in a particular way, to treat in a particular way, which may or may not be good. I think that basic, that basic interference is, is ethically wrong. So we need to readdress that. And I have uh, various plans to uh, institute as policy in stages, because obviously we're a young party, we want to listen to people. Um, the policy, for example, I'm the, uh, at the head of the health policy, I'm not going to dictate to people uh, what it should be. I have some ideas, I will present them in in stages so that they can work around it. And if they don't like it, we can bin it and then move forward from that point on. But we have some good ideas. I think what we need to do is to remain cognizant of the fact that the people matters most. And it's the way we do it has to be in consultation with them. We don't dictate to them, they tell us what, uh, what, to, do, what to achieve and we'll try and formulate the policies uh, in acquiescence to their requests. And then obviously now we're coming up to uh, local elections in May up and down the country. How's the party gearing up for that? And uh, what could uh, people do to get involved? Well, we have a, a party website. I'm very active on social media. Uh, we have just started with the easing of, um, of uh, social meetings. You know, we had to conduct things on Zoom and social media. It was very difficult. So what's happening is I'm now going to pubs and clubs, talking to people, meeting with people, and so are my colleagues. Next uh, Saturday, we are meeting people in Doncaster. Last week, I was in Skegness. Um, and I think we're heading towards um, Cornwall not long from now. So we have a program of going around the country. We, we don't have the big war chest of the main parties, but we are... We are singularly dedicated to help people realise a vision of a free Britain again. Oh, that's excellent. And that's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it all gets built from, uh, from, from getting out and meeting people and, and starting yeah. on those local elections. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Michael, thank you. you must, I, I say it very sincerely and very humbly, you must believe that uh, we're doing our best. And I think the, the signs are, are very telling. We... We have no egos. I mean, I, I wasn't wanting to be a leader, but somebody had to take the reins for a time. And I hope one day it, there'll be a good succession. A young man with, with energy, a young lady with energy will take over and lead the country, lead the party. Whatever it is, we have no egos. We are dedicated to helping the people. There's no two ways about it. If I don't have that passion, I will quit politics. What's the website address for people to uh, take a look at you guys? Yes, it's adfparty.uk. Thank you very much for that, Tech. It's been uh, enlightening. So, Thank you, Mike, man. what have we been uh, what have we been up to for the last few weeks? Well, we've been uh, out and about a bit ourselves. We had our no passports required uh, Thursday, Wednesday drinks a couple of days ago, as we record this uh, in the George in Croydon. Great to meet up with lots of liberty lovers uh, and and enjoy them we've got another drinks of that ilk uh, on the wednesday the 16th of march uh, uh from 7 p.m in the georgian croydon again so that's a 
uh, uh, you know, a month later on the third Wednesday, uh, the 16th of March. But before then, we've got our hustings. So uh, promoting uh, liberty loving parties, uh, some of the smaller parties that are be running in, in and around Croydon in the local elections. That's Thursday, the 24th of February in Clyde Hall in Croydon. That's uh, from 7 p.m. We've got the Christian People's Alliance, the Heritage Party, an independent candidate for mayor, uh, the SDP and the Libertarian Party. So that's Thursday, the 24th of Feb from 7 p.m. in Clyde Hall. Um, otherwise, I uh, think may Thing we'll be up to. I've been busy writing away for a newsletter called Free Speech, um, issued by Blacklist Press. Uh, there's a couple of articles from me in there uh, recently uh, covering things like uh, can can anything survive the help of the council? So uh, a quite a Croydon centric item uh, for a national um, bulletin. But talked about Croydon Council's involvement in uh, Surrey Street Market. So if your local person might be interesting to uh, read that for you and how, frankly, all their help uh, done nothing but cause problems. Uh, there's also articles in there, recent editions for me, about uh, the Freedom Associations event that Nigel Farage spoke at and about Partygate. So lots of other interesting articles in there for different people who believe in freedom. Uh, well worth checking out. Excellent. No, and really looking forward to the, uh, to the hustings on the 24th. Should be, a, should be a great evening. Well, if you'd like to write for our website or have any stories that you'd like us to cover, please do contact us. You can do so via the Twitter at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page, via our website, croydonconstitutionalist.uk, or via email, croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. Well, do please subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Do please like, share and leave a review. It's always good to get feedback and it helps others to find the podcast. Well, thank you very much to uh, Tech for uh, joining us on the podcast today. It's been uh, really good to speak with you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to everybody for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Stay free, everybody. 